Okay. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to this ERCnet webinar. My name is Francesco Emma and I'm speaking from my office in Rome. Before we starting as usual, let me remind you that your microphones are turned off, but that during and after the webinar, you can send your question through the application that is present on your screen. I will ask your question at the end of the presentation. The webinar will last approximately 30 minutes and we will then have approximately 15 minutes uh, available for your questions. Our speaker today is Jan Baker, who is currently an attending pathologist at the University Hospital of Cologne in Germany. Dr. Baker is uh, the current chair of the Nephropathology Task Force of ERCnet. In the past, he has been the chair of several committees of the Renal Pathology Society, including the Educational Committee, the Research and Scientific Committee, and the International Committee. He is the current chair of the Banff Working Group for Rules and Dissemination, and he is a co-author on the Banff 2015 and 2017 updates. His major research interests are in the evaluation of donor biopsy specimens, thrombotic microangiopathies, antibody-mediated rejection, C3 glomerulopathies, IgM, and in general, uh, on the approach to renal pathology diagnosis. The title of his talk today is Histopathology of Antibody-Mediated Rejection. So please, Jan. Thank you very much, Francesco, and uh, thanks for giving me this inv uh, invitation to uh, present about antibody-mediated rejection from a pathologist's perspective. Um, So when we talk about ADMR, antibody-mediated rejection, uh, we need to, uh, first to consider the theory of antibody-mediated rejection. Um, of course, um, the center of this theory is the donor-specific antibody, here in the usual Y form as an immunoglobulin. And then, of course, we have the donor cell with its nucleus and its cytoplasm. and um, this particular antibody uh, can bind to HLA class 1, class 2, if it's worse, or other antigens which we don't really test for and which we don't very much know about. And uh, then it's not only this antibody binding, but uh, binding through these uh, antigens and uh, various other receptor-like um, antigens on the surface, something happens with the donor cell. Um, some intracellular mechanisms are kicked off. And um, it's not only that, but um, this donor-specific antibody can also elicit damage through other mechanisms. Of course, one of them is complement, but that's not all. There's also various effector cells involved, so it's not only humoral or antibody-mediated, but um, effector cells are also involved depicted here by this mononuclear cells, those could be NK cells, of course, B cells, and various sorts of T cells. And let's not forget about platelets, uh, depicted here with this P, and uh, it's not only platelets who are activated and are active in this process, but um, the coagulation cascade as well, which is closely intertwined with the complement pathway, as we know. And all of that, of course, can also cause damage to the donor cell. And um, from that, we learn um, that to diagnose ABMR, we need a multidisciplinary approach. It's not just the pathologist who makes that diagnosis, but to really be sure about what we are doing, to making the right diagnosis, we need a multidisciplinary approach, and I cannot stress this enough. Immunogeneticists are uh, very important here, of course, and also your input as the clinician uh, counts. So what do we see as pathologists? Um, I will lead you through the individual findings uh, by this sketch from Baumann, who discovered the nephron and depicted it here. And uh, to start there, uh, from where the blood comes in is the arteries. And uh, we can break this down into activity uh, findings and chronicity findings, which I will show a bit later. So, of course, activity in the arteries uh, shows as um, endarteritis, like here. You see the lifted 
endothelial cells and underneath that the mononuclear cells having lifted off the endothelial cells here. That is classic endarteritis. Why is this an artery? Because it has at least two uh, smooth muscle cells in the media. And um, um, it became recently uh, very, very apparent uh, based on uh, the uh, retrospective assessment of more than 2,000 biopsies, which have been uh, in the Paris archive. And uh, in these biopsies, they found 302 with rejection, and 19 of those had arteritis, which we would call BANF type 2, acute TCL mediated rejection, which is also a component of antibody mediated rejection. And they looked at the clinical pathological correlations of these cases, and 64 of these 90 patients, so 71%, uh, could have been diagnosed with ABMR, antibody mediated rejection. A lot of these patients also had microvascular inflammation, and that really made clear that the old paradigm that vascular rejection, whatever vascular is, uh, equals antibody mediated rejection became a very, very um, apparent again. And that's led to the inclusion of uh, endarteritis as another uh, criterion for antibody mediated rejection in the BAMF update 2013, where it has stayed ever since. Of course, um, there can also be chronic lesions in the arteries that are related to antibody mediated rejection, and we call those transplant vasculopathy. This has been defined as accelerated atherosclerosis uh, by this uh, very interesting manuscript from Gary Hill, published in Jason in 2011. And uh, this is probably what he had in mind at that time. It just looks like very bland atherosclerosis or arteriosclerosis in this large artery. Uh, a lot of elastic laminae in, in the intima and uh, the lumen is severely narrowed here. It's obstructed. Of course, um, this is only one end of the spectrum. Um, the middle bit of that spectrum uh, is depicted here. This is, again, a um, heavily, um, heavily uh, broadened intima here with obstruction. And you can see that it's not all elastic laminae here. Um, there is uh, some myxoid bits here in the intima. That spectrum is this frank form cell, purely inflammatory lesion in the intima um, that most pathologists uh, would not hesitate um, to call a transplant vasculopathy and hence a sign of antibody mediated rejection. However, um, when we consider transplant vasculopathy, um, it's very clear that this is still, according to the BANF classification, a hybrid lesion. It's recognized as a chronicity parameter of ABMR and TCMR. And um, you can only uh, count this as a chronicity parameter for ABMR if TCMR, even in the history of that particular transplant, is excluded. And moreover, it's considered as a chronicity parameter only for chronic active ABMR, not for chronic ABMR, for whatever reason. And uh, the question, of course, is why can it not be recognized as both ABMR and TCMR, just like we do with arteritis, the acute form at this stage? And of course, it's very interesting uh, to learn more about the correlation with transplant vasculopathy, which is another chronicity parameter more downstream um, in the circulation. So the correlation with microvascular manifestations is something we are very much interested in. I hope I can present you much more about that in the near future. And of course, the prognostic impact of transplant vasculopathy, that's very interesting, and we don't know very much about this, and or even how to define this. Further downstream, the arterioles here depicted in red. Um, this is even more terra incognita. It's very clear that uh, ABMR also manifests as active and chronic lesions in the arterioles. However, that has never really been um, recognized by the BANF classification. And uh, although we must appreciate that TMA, arteriolitis, and vasculopathy can also occur in this particular segment. And uh, all that we know is arteriolitis carries a poor prognosis, whatever that means. Um, the data is not very clear about that. So more work needs to be done 
there. And in practice, most pathologists uh, disregard that this is an arteriole uh, where they find this particular lesion. They often uh, just report this as an artery and uh, make this arteriolitis and arteritis, and then it becomes less complicated. Further downstream, the glomerulus, the glomerular tuft, the activity parameters um, we call transplant glomerulitis. And this is a classic example. What you see here is you see a lot of mononuclear cells. It could also be neutrophils in the glomerular capillaries. And alongside with that, we see swollen endothelial cells. And uh, this is an active inflammatory pattern here. And this has long been considered an indicator for rejection, starting even in 1981 in this New England Journal manuscript. There was a rather broad definition for what transplant glomerulitis is, uh, adopted in the 99 update, uh, based, published in 99. Uh, this is uh, Banff 1997. In that manuscript, you find glomerulitis defined for the first time. And uh, to my mind, the best definition of this lesion, this glomerulitis lesion, is based on this manuscript published by Ibrahim Batal and Panji Dwandhava in 2009. They looked at 111 biopsies, and uh, their definition they found best correlates with a lot of uh, clinically relevant parameters, and the outcome, very important, of course, is equal or more than five leukocytes per glomerulus, a very simple and elegant way of uh, grading this particular lesion. In 2013, there was a change in the glomerulitis parameter introduced, and this was based on the retrospective assessment of just 47 cases without correlating outcome, just DSA and C4D. And uh, this led to the redefinition that it's now defined as complete or partial occlusion of at least a capillary loop by uh, endothelial cells and leukocytes, whatever that means. And uh, we don't know how reproducible that is really. And uh, we don't know whether the uh, reproducibility can be improved by immunohistochemistry. What we do know is if you take this BANF 2013 definition, if you look at this individual lesion, BANF G greater one, so if any glomerulitis is present, the graft survival is worse, regardless of DSA and C4D. It's an independent prognostic parameter. If the lesions uh, get more severe, endothelial dysfunction gets more severe, what you can find then is microthrombi. Here, this is a platelet thrombus lodging in that glomerular capillary, and the definition varies widely. Of course, you can find these formed by arteries, and you can find them in arterioles. You can see endothelial damage and or glomerular or preglomerular wall remodeling, uh, as has been described in the C. Jason manuscript. And uh, currently, a BAMF working group is uh, working on consensus definitions for the histopathological diagnosis of TMA in kidney transplants. Um, we have looked at this particular lesion and we found uh, that about uh, a third of these cases are caused by ABMR or could be attributed to ABMR. And interestingly, we found diminished ADM, ADM GS13, the von Willebrand factor cleaving protease um, in uh, those glomerular tufts. And that could nicely explain the thrombus formation in uh, ABMR. And uh, however, uh, you're also probably, probably aware of this manuscript from 2008. Again, about a third of these patients with de novo TMA uh, were found to have mutations in CFH or CFI as some sort of underlying proclivity to thrombus formation in uh, these patients. Um, so the situation is not very clear with TMA, and we don't know very much about the prognostic impact or even the causes of this particular lesion, the association with ADMR. Of course, uh, ADMR can also manifest uh, chronically in glomeruli, and we call that transplant glomerulopathy. And the defining lesion is uh, the splitting of the glomerular basement membrane, as you can see here nicely in this silver stain. So what we do know is if there's transplant glomerulopathy, there's 62% transplant loss within that observation time, 45 month plus minus 19. 
in this uh, manuscript from 2008. And we do know that there's a 5.3-fold increase in risk of graft loss or doubling of serum creatinine. So uh, this is definitely does have some uh, prognostic impact this particular lesion. However, um, there's a lot of uh, causes uh, for the split glomerular basement membranes, and uh, you need to be sure um, that this is really ABMR and not something else, for example, uh, recurrent glomerular nephritis, or maybe uh, recurrent TMA in a patient with atypical HUS, for example. A very interesting finding in these patients with transplant glomerulopathy is that some do show lesions which look like immune complexes. Here in the mesangial fields and here subendothelial immune complexes. And we've looked at this, uh, 55 patients were from Imperial College with transplant glomerulopathy. And after we really re um, rigorously excluded other causes of these immune complexes, for example, de novo or recurrent glomerulonephritis and hepatitis C, we found eight patients had these immune complexes in their transplant glomerulopathy uh, lesions, and six were tested for HLA, DSA, and only one of them had them. And this is very similar to the situation in uh, Fisher 344 to Lewis kidney transplantation, where there's only HLA class one antibodies and a host of other uh, antibodies against um, glomerular antigens. And you could really nicely explain in situ uh, immune complex formation um, driven by these antibodies against um, the donor glomerulus. Further downstream, peritubular capillaries, very much the same happens as in the glomeruli. Uh, the active lesions we call peritubular capillaritis. And you see here accumulation of usually mononuclear cells in these peritubular capillaries. This has been um, considered an old criterion for ABMR mentioned by Halloran and uh, was included in the BAMF uh, score in, 2000, in the 2017, uh, 2007 update as BAMF lesion score PTC. And it's again an independent prognostic parameter. Peritubular capillary C4D, C4D deposition was very instrumental and very useful in uh, bringing back the old idea of antibody mediated ejection because for the first time you could see the impact of the donor specific antibody and the complement uh, deposition on the endothelial cell, like here in this immunohistochemical stain. You should be aware that medullary vasa recta also count um, in this score. And uh, the sensitivity for um, the C4D positivity for donor-specific antibodies is rather low. It's considered to be 35%. However, the specificity is near perfect with 98%. So if you see C4D positivity in your transplant, you can be pretty sure that you'll find a donor-specific antibody on serological testing. Um, however, um, a lot of authors have found that um, if you have peritubular capillaritis or microvascular inflammation in general, C4D becomes less important for prognosis. So it's um, unclear how important, uh, how good a marker uh, the C4D positivity is for antibody mediated rejection. And you should also know and be aware that C4D is usually negative with these non HLA antibodies like this anti angiotensin uh, type 1 receptor antibody, which has been reported recently. So um, C4D negative antibody mediated rejection is definitely a fact. It does occur, and uh, you might have encountered this in your clinical practice uh, also quite often. So if we look at macrovascular inflammation, glomerulitis and peritubular capillaritis summed up versus C4D staining, it is clear that glomerulitis and peritubular capillaritis I guess we we've lost Jan um, and um, 
Well, I, uh, I think the connection. Um, okay, Jan. There was a problem with the Wi-Fi. I'm not in my office, but um, in another hospital. Okay, we can hear you again. Um, can you? Okay, we, we lost you at the beginning of this slide. Okay, sorry. Um, so, uh, if you look at microvascular inflammation versus C4D positivity, uh, and microvascular inflammation is defined as glomerulitis and peritubular capillaritis summed up these scores, it's clear that MVI is a more sensitive parameter for DSA positivity than C4D. And microvascular inflammation correlates with graft loss within four years independently of C4D. However, in recent years, it has become apparent that uh, C4D might still be useful. And um, if we look at the beginning of C4D, for example, uh, the uh, sensitivity and specificity was considered near perfect with triple layer immunofluorescence. It might be that uh, donor specific antibody testing got much more sensitive than in the early 2000s. Uh, these data from Vienna have shown and re established that C4D is an independent prognostic factor for graft survival. So it does matter, but probably less so than microvascular inflammation. Um, you can also find chronic lesions in the peritubular capillaries, and this is splitting of the basement membrane of the peritubular capillaries. You can see here a peritubular capillary, the uh, erythrocyte, the endothelial cell immediately underneath, and you see the split uh, basement membrane there. And this has long been considered a parameter for rejection, uh, even from the 90s. Um, it's barely visible by light microscopy, hence you have to uh, resort to electron microscopy, and it has been shown to indicate early chronic ABMR. And it's been precisely defined in the BANF 2013 update as severe peritubular capillary basement membrane multilayering, which is considered a chronicity parameter for ABMR. And uh, however, this is still under refinement, and there's a BEMF working group uh, devoted to that particular subject, and uh, you can expect an update on that in the Pittsburgh meeting in 2019 in September this year. Tubular interstitial lesions can also be found, and those are tubular interstitial infiltrates. Of course, uh, those are classified as um, acute T cell mediated rejection or borderline as well. You can see them here with tubulitis, and it's clear that if you find concurrent acute TCMR without borderline in that particular um, reference, uh, those patients have a worse prognosis in C4D positive antibody mediated rejection. So these tubular interstitial infiltrates also matter and are probably at least a little bit driven by this antibody mediated rejection. To my experience, those infiltrates are mostly borderline uh, acute TCMR, and uh, it would be very interesting to know whether there's a particular pattern that is different from just pure TCMR in these combined ABMR and TCMR cases. Then lastly, and uh, far away from uh, morphology, there's the molecular microscope, and what is done there is you uh, harvest one co uh, core, and subject it to an RNA hybridization array, and uh, you examine for transcripts from largely unpublished data, and uh, those are arranged in particular sets, DSASTs, for example, or NDATs and ethereal transcripts, and uh, those NDATs have been validated in multi-center studies, for example, the Intercom study, um, as a parameter for uh, antibody mediated rejection. However, you only get a score, a likelihood score, and uh, it's really not clear how useful that is in daily practice, and uh, it's not clear whether this can really be called the new gold standard as it's propagated right now. And it's even been included in the BANF classification here, chronicity parameters, activity parameters, antibody interaction with tissue and donor-specific antibodies or equivalents, and those transcriptome parameters are considered equivalent to DSA. So some sort of gold standard right now. Although 
no method has been officially recognized by Banff now um, as transcriptome indicative of ABMR. So this is still Jan, I think we lost you again. We cannot hear you again. So we don't really know how good this is in daily practice. Of course, we can also ramp up our uh, pathology. We can do multi-channel immunofluorescence. And uh, for example, here, green are all leukocytes. Here, we can mark endothelial cells. And I could, uh, with a digital pathology approach, I could tell you exactly how many leukocytes are on this particular slide, how many are inside the capillaries, how many are outside the capillaries. And this really adds precision and is uh, quite useful. Uh, if particularly if you um, then apply um, deep learning, imaging, uh, and spatial statistic analysis uh, for these multi-channel IF stains. And uh, this is also something we are currently working on. Then homebrew QRT-PCR, um, the group from Imperial College has uh, um, done a predictive model based on these particular transcripts that correlates with transplant survival in ABMR. And again, this uh, needs validation, of course, in prospective studies. And uh, something that will be unveiled in Pittsburgh in September during the BANF meeting is um, the uh, nanostring technology, which allows you to simultaneously um, measure 800 mRNA transcripts and uh, the BANF consortium led by Bob Colvin is about um, to have a custom-made um, uh, nanostring panel and that covers TCMR, ABMR, BK virus nephropathy and tubal interstitial scarring. And um, this will be available to everybody and uh, we can all um, use this panel and uh, accumulate and share data, which will be rather useful, I think, in the future. So how do we arrive at these diagnoses then? This is a rather complicated scheme that brings us to currently four diagnoses. Two of them have been ditched uh, with the last update. One is C4D positivity without evidence of rejection. This is what it's called. Then we have active ABMR, we have chronic active ABMR, and we have chronic ABMR. And this is um, the parameters we need to look at and we need to consider the chronicity parameters, the activity parameters, then antibody interaction with tissue, and then donor-specific antibodies or equivalents. And if you look closely at these uh, and leave out the chronicity parameters, you see that there's a lot of duplicates in there. For example, glomerulitis and peritubular clapperulitis appears in activity parameters and antibody interaction with tissue. C4D positivity appears as antibody interaction with tissue and as DSA equivalent. And if you want to bring some sort of systematics in there, then it's clear that um, you have increasing specificity here. The further down you go, the more specific this is. And um, you start here, for example, with acute tubular damage in the absence of any other apparent cause. I don't even know what that means. This is probably the least specific we can find. And then, the, of course, the most specific for this particular pathway of damage is the um, serology uh, proof of donor-specific antibodies. So let's look at how we do this in practice. Um, and Tanya, if you could show us the first multiple choice question, please. So, which constellation of diagnostic findings would be diagnosed as antibody-mediated rejection according to BANF 2017-2018? Um, the first option is acute tubular injury, BANF C4D positivity, no microvascular inflammation, DSA is negative. Second option would be you have a borderline infiltrate, um, you have BANF PTC3, you have DSA positivity, you have 
uh, DQ7 antibody with an MFI of 5,000. Third option would be you have autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease as the primary disease. You find thrombotic microangiopathy and quite widespread and active in your biopsy. C4D is negative, DSA is positive. Again, a DQ7 with an MFI of 10,000. Fourth option would be acute TCMR grade three. So you have really severe transmural arteritis with necrosis. You don't have microvascular inflammation. C4D is negative. And again, you have a donor specific antibody uh, with the same specificity and the same strength. And uh, last, you have acute TCMR 2A, so uh, mild and arteritis. DSA is positive. Uh, again, with that strength and that specificity, and you have um, severe peritubular capillaritis. Which of these constellations would be diagnostic according to BANF uh, for antibody mediated rejection? Please give me your answer now. Very interesting. Very interesting. So um, the right answer would have been the first one. So acute tubular injury is recognized as an activity parameter according to BANF, and uh, it's uh, considered uh, on the same level as, uh, for example, thrombotic microangiopathy due to antibody-mediated rejection or and arteritis for example and if you find that and you have c4d positivity then you don't even need a dsa positivity anymore you don't need any other parameter this is active abmr of course um, you'd be worried about all the other options here particularly this one ptc3 and uh, this dsa you would also be very worried about this particular biopsy and the pma biopsy you probably also treat all these patients here, and it shows that um, what the BANF classification gives you uh, is probably not very much founded in reality, and it's something probably that you wouldn't really follow in daily practice religiously. So if we continue with the presentation, thank you. Uh, oops. So we have to be aware that these data, um, although I wish they existed, they don't exist. We don't have any data that show you for a particular index biopsy um, that the prognosis for these uh, diagnostic categories that BANF offers us is different. We don't even know whether it's different uh, from, the, uh, from any biopsy without these uh, diagnosis of antibody-mediated rejection. Frankly, these data don't exist. Uh, they don't exist for the current uh, way of how we are expected to diagnose antibody-mediated rejection according to BANF. And this is because there have been considerable changes in the BANF classification from 1997 to the last iteration in 2017. The older literature lacks current standard DSA testing. Comparison between studies is difficult because also uh, the histopathological um, parameters and the rules have changed and of course there's always reproducibility issues uh, not only with DSA and DSA testing but also with histology of course. So there's in fact very little evidence for ABMR diagnosis and how uh, their prognostic impact is. And if we consider that uh, of course you could uh, fall into despair and you could think about whether we should abandon BANF and uh, should move beyond BANF, but you should realize that BANF is a process with the classification as its product. And uh, it's very much like democracy or the European Union. You might not be happy with the particular results uh, that this is generating for you. However, the method and the system is pretty much brilliant and uh, 
you could uh, also gather um, evidence with novel techniques, you could uh, collate large cohorts, you could bring in hard evidence based on big data, you could discuss this with the BANF uh, Foundation and the meetings, the biannual meetings, and uh, the BANF classification could then involve and be better and bettered and uh, could be your ideal diagnostic tool in the future. So definitely going it alone is not an option. Um, we should get involved there. And uh, I think we as uh, ERCnet have a pretty strong position there and uh, could change things for the better now. So what should we do now with this situation right now? If we look at this mosaic of uh, diagnosis here, it's a rather black and white pattern here. You have chronic inactive ABMR, you have chronic active ABMR, you have active ABMR, and you have no ABMR, and something in between, which we don't really know what it is, C4D positivity without evidence of rejection. And this is a rather a natural situation anyway. If we consider um, for example, lupus glomerulonephritis, also something that is mediated by antibodies. Uh, we would never be happy with a lupus classification like this. And uh, we would look for something beyond that. And uh, since we, again, have very little evidence for this bunch of ABMR diagnosis, we could look for replacing this with something else. And the hypothesis is all transplants undergo rejection at all times, just with different activity. And if you accept this, and also that all ABMR parameters are independent predictors of worse outcome, then you could come up with a new scheme and you could propose this to BANF and uh, maybe it will be accepted there. You have a sum score of ABMR activity with your donor-specific antibody, with your histological lesions, with transcripts. You have a sum score of ABMR chronicity with tubular interstitial scarring, transplant, glomerulopathy, FSGS, and um, so on and so on. And for example, your particular biopsy, your index biopsy, would sit there high up on the ABMR activity score, not so much chronicity, and then you would treat that particular patient and uh, compare this to this other patient, which has a lot more chronicity, less activity, and your treatment would probably bring down that particular patient with a lot of activity, less chronicity, to there. And uh, maybe that is something we need to look at in the future, but we definitely need collaboration. We need large data um, to achieve that. And uh, I would really invite you to collaborate on this. Um, I think Certain and the ERCnet Pediatric Transplant Working Group would be a fabulous platform to achieve all this. So please do contact Marion Rabin, who is currently the Pediatric Transplant Working Group Nephropathology Panel Chair, or contact me, and we'd be happy to uh, get you involved in this effort to improve the diagnostics. And with that, I would like to close my presentation, and uh, I'm curious about your questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Jan. Uh, um, I must say I was really looking forward to your presentation and I was hopeful that you would uh, clear all my doubts on antibody-mediated rejection. Um, and I see that there's still a lot of open questions. And in fact, we already are, uh, are receiving questions. So, uh, um, so I will start asking you these questions. So uh, uh, Jack Wetzels from the Netherlands uh, wrote this question. Would you consider positive C4D staining of the peritubular capillaries in the absence of microvascular inflammation sufficient to diagnose antibody-mediated rejection in a patient with donor-specific antibodies, tubulopathy, and a slight deterioration of EGFR? Um, yes, I would definitely think uh, that there's something going on, but I really like to think in terms of uh, these activity and chronicity parameters, and uh, this is probably something that Jack Wessels, uh, as a glomerulonephritis expert, is very familiar with, and I would tailor my approach very much uh, what you find uh, outside of histology. For example, is your donor-specific antibody class 1, 
then it's probably less severe and that would require less treatment or um, less aggressive treatment than, for example, if your donor-specific antibody would be a class 2 uh, donor-specific antibody that would probably be complement binding. You really try to sum up uh, and bring to the table what you have in terms of negative prognostic parameters um, and uh, you would consider all of these activity parameters and if you are convinced that this is active enough that this requires some sort of treatment then yes i would treat but um, if for example it's only a class one and with a very low mfi uh, watchful waiting uh, could also be a, a strategy that is worthwhile. And we really don't have very many data on these biopsies, and uh, so this really gives you freedom um, to choose your approach and uh, just follow your gut instinct as a nephrologist, think in terms of activity, publicity, gather all the findings, and then make an informed decision here. Okay, so I, I think you already answer also the second question of, uh, of Dr. Wetzel, uh, which later wrote, can pathology help to select the most suitable therapy? And, um, and I think with what you just said, I think that uh, you already answered this question. I think that from, uh, from all your talk, I think that we clearly need more data uh, about this, but um, I would guess that the interaction with the pathologist is essential. Um, we have several questions, so I will ask you to, to try to be um, uh, concise. So, uh, uh, Marius uh, uh, Miglinas uh, from um, uh, Vilnius in Lithuania um, asks you how would you suggest to make a differential diagnosis between recurrent and de novo uh, TMA versus uh, AMR? Um, I would always follow a hierarchical exclusion approach. First, you have to make sure that you're not uh, dealing with um, recurrent uh, thrombotic microangiopathy, recurrent AHUS. And uh, so really look for the uh, native biopsy if that's available, dig it out from the archive, look for evidence. And I'm really suspicious if I read something like, for example, hypertensive nephropathy or malignant uh, hypertension as primary disease. Um, then do your um, testing like you would do for an atypical HUS patient. Next in line is, uh, of course, uh, the uh, antibody-mediated rejection-associated TMA. Again, look for evidence there. Do your DSA testing. Maybe also do testing for uh, AT1 receptor antibodies or non-HLA DSAs. And um, the only thing that is definitely proof that this is ABMI is if you find C4D positivity in peritubular capillaries. But as we've learned, um, C4D is a uh, rather low sensitivity marker for um, antibody mediated rejection. You, uh, so the negative predictive value of that is rather low. But that's about the only thing you could look at. Um, really, you have to gather all your data, um, do your testing for atypical HUS, do your DSA testing, and uh, if you don't find C4D positivity, you're lucky, and then you can uh, determine this is ABMR. If you don't find it, uh, your clinical judgment and discussion with your pathologist would be helpful here. Yes, and, 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 and Dr. Uh, Ra Raham um, is actually asking you how can you diagnose antibody-mediated rejection in low-resources countries where uh, where you can't do electron microscopy? This is her question. Would you like to say something about that? I don't think you need electron microscopy for ABMR diagnostics, I would say. Um, I think C4D is helpful. And uh, so if you say have C4D, I wouldn't bother about that because uh, we don't really know what we're diagnosing with severe peritubular base, capillary basement membrane multilayering right now. So the data is not very much there. So it's not worthwhile doing electron microscopy. And uh, same with transplant glomerulopathy, the early stages of transplant glomerulopathy. 
which is only visible on electron microscopy. Again, we don't know very much about how these lesions develop, um, so it's not really worthwhile looking at that. So if um, I wouldn't invest money in that if I were uh, living in a diagnosing in a low resource country, I would rather go for DSA testing and C4D positivity. Thank you. And, and just, just um, uh, this is a curiosity that I had. In these eight cases where you had these, what you call immune complexes uh, that you've seen by EM, uh, did you have a positivity by immunofluorescence in these biopsies? Yes, both were mostly uh, IgM positive, but um, this is uh, something that shows up in most transplant glomerulopathy cases, at least to my experience, is a lot of the basement membranes get impregnated, if you consider this pathogenetic or not, I don't know, with uh, IgM and a uh, little bit less IgG, a little bit less again IgA, a lot of C1Q, a little bit less C3C. Um, so the differential between uh, MPGN uh, and transparent globopathy can be a tough one. Um, so we don't know what in there is trapping and not, unless you do electron microscopy. But again, I think uh, in most cases, a good silver stain will sort out that problem and uh, will help you establish a diagnosis of transplant glomerulopathy and you don't okay. need in these instances. That was just a curiosity that I had when you uh, listened to your talk. So Luisa Mure uh, from Padova is actually thanking you for your presentation. And she, she's asking what you think about anti-endothelin and C4D positivity, and uh, anti-endothelin antibodies with C4D positivity. I think it's, um, these developments are rather interesting, and uh, all these non-HLA DSA antibodies, uh, DSAs, uh, something we should keep in mind because right now we are left with a lot of uh, transplant glomerulopathy patients which have never been shown to have an HLA DSA and I reckon there's going to be a lot of non-HLA DSA that we are not testing right now and that would be interesting and uh, the same applies to these anti endothelium one antibodies and uh, whether this regularly yields C4D positivity or not is something that is very interesting and uh, that needs to be looked at in the future. Okay, thank you. And, and I have a last question um, and it refers to these cases that have isolated C4D staining without anything else. And I just want to ask you, what do you think is the value of a repeat biopsy in these patients? Um, I think uh, I would uh, look for microalbuminuria in these patients. I think this would be a rather sensitive parameter because most of these ABMR cases deteriorate via uh, some sort of microvascular damage, and this usually shows with microalbuminuria. So I would do a refined uh, DSA testing. Uh, to risk stratify the patients and I would uh, do a close surveillance with um, uh, serum creatinine and proteinuria and uh, if there should show anything I would retest and uh, look for microvascular inflammation which would be like the next step up in uh, terms of activity here. Okay, well, uh, Jan, thank you very much. This was, uh, this was clearly a very interesting and I think we've learned a lot. Uh, again, thank you and to everybody who see you. Oh, hold on a second. Um, Jack Wessel just stepped in to ask you a last question. Microalbuminuria is difficult in patients with native kidney, especially with preemptive transplantation. And most of these patients have some proteinuria. I guess this was not a question, it was just uh, uh, a remark that he made. And I think that, uh, you know, as a, uh, 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 a prominent clinician and a very experienced clinician, um, he probably puts his finger on something that in the clinical practice is often the case. Uh, would you like to comment on this before we, 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 we close this, the webinar? Yes, I think uh, Jack is absolutely right, and uh, I'm certainly not an expert in proteinuria. This is much more in uh, his and your field. Um, however, uh, 
I think there's uh, uh, proteinuria in these patients uh, where um, you're not running into these problems is a worthwhile parameter to look at and something that needs uh, to be investigated in the future, also in terms of cost effectiveness um, to limit your resources for these expensive tests on those that show some sort of microvascular damage. Okay. Well, um, again, thank you very much. And thank you. Uh, thank you all. And we'll keep you posted on the next webinar. I think you will shortly receive an email um, with the program of the next webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye.